yeah, um, the subject that I want to talk to you about today is uh, narrative design, uh, specifically mobile narrative design. Even though these um, best practices that I'm trying to set up um, will apply to any game genre, I will just go into detail in how far mobile games are a little different than other uh, platforms. So um, the structure is going to be that I'm going to start with a little intro, then tell you something about what narrative design can do and what bad narrative design can do, then go into a case study on mobile games as a medium, and then um, set up some best practices. Um, I'm estimating that's going to be like around an hour. So, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Valentina Tamer, uh, Val for short. I'm a narrative and game designer, currently employed at King. I'm the studio narrative designer here in Berlin, because I'm the only narrative designer in the studio. Um, and I'm also doing a lot of game design. Uh, beforehand, I've worked at Daedalic Entertainment in Hamburg, who are um, probably mostly known for their adventure games like Deponia or um, uh, Edna the Breakout. Um, and I was a narrative and game designer there too. So I wrote for point and click adventures and um, for mobile games. Um, at King, I'm working with the Candy Crush franchise. And at Daedalic, I worked on uh, Ken Follett's The Pillars of the Earth and The Night of the Rabbit. And before that, I was also an artist at Silent Dreams Games for a little bit, because I do art too. Uh, also, I got a bachelor's in uh, game design at uh, Media Design Hochschule Düsseldorf. Cool, so um, why am I even talking about this? Because whenever I tell people what I do for a living right now, they're like, what? But I didn't think Candy Crush had a story. What do you do all day? And that is, um, yeah, that misunderstanding is based on um, definitions, actually. That people have a wrong understanding of what narrative design is, because it's different from game writing, actually. The expectation is, is that you write text and dialogue, and you like sit somewhere in a room alone, and it's just like writing text all day. But in actuality, um, being a narrative designer is very much a team activity, um, where you work together with the entire team to use the, every element of a video game to form the narrative experience of a player. So that is very decision heavy and cross function. And I feel like turning off this vent, uh, this thing, because I feel like it's blowing into my mic all the time. Uh, better. <laughs> cool. So, in short, uh, narrative design is way more than plot and text. It's in everything. It's uh, in the title of uh, an event. It's in the font you choose. It's in the um, interface, in the UX design. It's in the dialogue, in character choice, character design even in the animation, sounds, and settings. Basically, everything inside of a video game is part of the narrative experience. And here's a brief list of all the different things that make up narrative design. It is both the writing and the game design and the creative direction with all of these elements. Uh, usually, depending on where you work, um, your area of uh, responsibility differs. If a company has a game writer, you're probably not that heavy on the first pillar, um, but sometimes it's just a matter of project or company. Uh, also, not to underestimate, which I'm unfortunately not going to go into detail about today, is uh, narrative systems um, that you think of uh, mechanics that um, shape the narrative, like, um, Interactive storytelling, for example, is a narrative system because your choices influence how the game continues. But when you go into open world games, for example, the narrative systems become more complex where stories can emerge uh, naturally from interacting elements of a game system. So um, what can narrative design 
do when it's done right. Because you probably wonder, okay, but why should I care? Even, like, some of you probably think that story in a game is important because you like narrative games, but others who are more prone to play games for the game design, the mechanics, um, you're probably thinking, yeah, the story is just like a theme that you slap on, and it's not that important. But um, narrative design is essential in forming the player's um, motivation. Basically, a good narrative design should give the player um, the reason why they do things. Um, and this should also provide the emotional context of the situation. Depending on how the situation is framed, you will experience the same actions very differently. Uh, ideally, a good narrative also um, immerses and engages so that the player wants to continue playing. Um, it improves understanding and learning by using symbolism um, and elements that the player recognizes so that things are clear way easier than when you have to explain everything. Uh, and also, it gives a pleasant sense of coherency that you have that you don't have that sneaking feeling like, wait, something is weird here, or like, why is that this way right now? Um, it just uh, helps enable a sense of flow. And um, when you do all this, this leads to a deeper gaming experience in general, um, a better retention rate, which basically means players stay around with the game, like they keep on playing it longer. Um, and it can also create brand loyalty, because usually people care about characters and emotions rather than abstract stuff. And um, to go a little bit uh, into detail what these different things mean, um, here are some examples. Um, the meaning and motivation that you get in, in many Mario games is basically save the princess, and that is your emotional framework, why you're doing this and what every action um, is supposed to lead up to. But it can, of course, also be like in Portal, where it's like, oh yeah, you'll get a cake at the end of this puzzle. And um, that's your <laughs> framework. You're in a like, cold uh, world, and you get the promise of comfort food. Uh, context can influence how you experience the same game actions a lot. People tend to underestimate this. So in order to clarify this a little more, I'm going to look at um, two games that have actually pretty similar gameplay experience uh, in the core. Um, two rail shooters, um, which have a very different audience, I think. Probably some overlap, but um, in general very different. Uh, these games are House of the Dead Overkill and Galgan Double Peace. House of the Dead um, Overkill is basically a zombie rail shooter. It's creepy, it's creepy, it's like a horror film. And as you see, you shoot the zombies. Galgan, on the other hand, um, is, uh, well, you help girls escape the clutches of evil demons by giving them your love. But it's the same, <laughs> but it's the very same mechanic as you see, like, it, it even looks like similar. You have like the, um, uh, the crosshair and your standard is rail shooter. Um, but yeah, very different experience, even though the game mechanics are the same. Uh, learning and mod um, learning can be influenced, um, by using stuff that the player instantly recognizes instead of um, yeah, trying to explain everything with a long text. Like on the left example, this is a heart container. Heart is the center of the body and is usually has become to represent health and life. So whenever you get a heart in a game, you immediately know what it probably means unless the game tells you otherwise. Otherwise, you don't really have to explain it. And the key is also, like, you you have just unlocked something. Um, it, you don't really need to explain anything else but this symbol. And by using shorthand um, and symbolism, you can make the game experience much faster. So what happens when we have bad narrative design in our game? Uh, in general, it um, severely impairs the understanding of what the player is supposed to do, what they're supposed to feel, and um, 
yeah, it can range from logical understanding to emotional understanding. It slows players down because they have to think about stuff uh, more to understand it. Um, therefore, it interrupts flow, decreases fun, and um, players usually fail to create an emotional attachment and therefore a motivation to play. Cool, so now that we have uh, talked about the possibilities and the downfalls of good and bad narrative design, um, I want to take a detour into mobile games and how players play those. In general, you could say mobile gaming is fun, um, but people also do it out of habit. They don't um, necessarily use this as recreational time. They do, but not, not always. It's, it's more of a habit that you develop because your phone is always with you. Uh, mobile plays in general um, play most often during downtime, uh, during their commute, um, on break or while they wait for something, um, but also during the evenings. So some people actually like sit down on their couch or lie down in bed in the evening to just play mobile games for hours. Um, but since we have these super short time units throughout the day as well, uh, it influences how people play mobile games. Um, they are they're used to having really short information units, may that be on social media or YouTube, um, and they take their stuff from multiple sources. You don't use your phone for one thing, usually. You have Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and... Um, Twitch, some uh, news site that you sub subscribe to, Instagram, um, all these different uh, sources, and you usually go like back and forth between them um, for short bursts of time. So that means that um, the attention span is pretty short, and the time they spend per you, uh, per um, consumption unit is pretty short as well. And um, the funny thing about mobile games is that the biggest competition isn't necessarily other mobile games, they're there too, but other app categories are actually competing for um, the audience's attention as well. So, for example, like Candy Crush's competition is also social networking and sending messages and streaming and music and news and also the weather. Um, and not only that, games um, on your phone also compete for your attention um, with other activities outside of your phone. Usually when you play on your console, I know some people have like something else open as well, um, but people are more likely to just focus on the thing that they're doing. But mobile games are pretty much an activity that you do on the side. Like, you watch TV or Netflix and play on your phone. Or you listen to music and you play on your phone. Or you eat food and play on your phone. Um, so basically, it is always divided attention, uh, left and right. Um, yeah, so the big question is, um, if players don't really pay attention to what they're doing, uh, how do we give them a good narrative design? <coughs> Yeah, and here I'm uh, going to try to set up some guidelines. It's not really a um, how to do the single aspects, but, but more of a what are things to consider? What are goals? What are, um, yeah, the best practices? So we've looked at how mobile games are played and realized um, they have pretty unique requirements. Um, the sessions and the games need to be um, easy to pick up and learn. Um, we have short play sessions, uh, and they need to be understood and played um, effectively, even if you play them without really paying attention. Um, players usually want minimal core gameplay inter interruptions, but that really depends on set expectations, what the core gameplay is, what they play it for. But if you have a, um, for example, if you have a, uh, an arcade style game and there's cutscenes in between, some players might find this really annoying that they have to go through, I don't know, two minutes of cutscene after playing for one minute. Um, and they would rather just continue and not have a story at all. 
And um, if you have a live game, so um, a mobile game that just keeps on going and gets new content all the time, um, then the narrative needs to function as a long-term experience so that you have to think about your storytelling structure. Like, is this going to be a seasonal thing where you bring in, release new episodes all the time um, with episodic content? Or does it have an emergent narrative so that there are systems in place that enable narrative, but it doesn't need to be crafted? Um, you can also think about player-generated content. And um, another problem in live games is that some information that players get never gets repeated, and they play it for like three, four years, and uh, because some uh, play mobile games for this long, and then um, the story hints at something that happened three years ago for them, and they're like, what? What is going on? So like, you have to craft a narrative that, that works over years of time. Uh, the five pillars of how to approach this are um, thinking about the conventions of the genre, of the medium, and of your game. Um, thinking about keeping consistency, making things clear and understandable, uh, thinking about the context of the narrative information, and also about how to deliver character and personality. And I'm going to go into all of these individually. So conventions in general is um, the research um, and definition of the expectations for your genre, brand, and individual game. Basically think about um, what are the expectations of your device that you're designing for. May that be mobile or um, console or um, even like target audience. Uh, what are the expectations in terms of length and depth of the narrative? Um, also, what are the genre, um, brand, and theme expectations? If you are creating um, a crime game of some sort, like a criminal investigation thing, you should be aware of how crime thrillers work in films and books and other games. Um, but you also need to think about the brand that you're representing, because often games are uh, actually branded and an adaptation of a series or um, a movie or a comic or just another sequel in a video game series and you have to be aware of the brand expectations. Um, also, what are, you, um, what are you conveying with your advertisement and your first time user experience? Um, when people play it for like I don't know, 10 minutes, they should know what to expect and they should have a good representation of how the tone and story is going to continue. And um, setting the right expectations in advertisement can be pretty crucial too, that when you um, sell your game as a like um, action-packed shooter of sorts, and then you never get to shoot, and it's just like story, 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 pew pew, story, 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 and people are like, I wanted an action shooter, what is this? Um, also interesting to think about is um, what the player's cultural expectations of symbolism is. Um, this is usually also a problem in um, localization um, because some things don't translate this that well um, when it comes to um, imagery of animals or colors, for example, or even more specific things like, um, I don't know, political figures or something. Um, the target audience as a whole, will all of them get it equally? Is this, um, does this match the cultural expectations? And if not, I mean, you can break them, but if you do, you should probably explain, because otherwise people will just be confused. Like, huh? But usually hearts give me life. Why, why don't I get lice? What, what happened? Like, what, what did actually change? I collected this heart. And then they're like, oh, I now have money in my pocket. Why? <laughs> uh, some examples for um, being aware of your brand identity is, um, for example, the Love Island mobile game, which is basically uh, a dating sim. Um, for those of you who don't know Love Island, it's this um, British TV series where um, 
uh, attractive young people are put on an island and they're engaging in funny games and dating each other. It's like Big Brother, but like Big Brother meets The Bachelor, kind of. Um, and the mobile game is all about relationships between characters and choosing what to say and um, uh, yeah, having the choice between a different characters to continue with. But it's also a big focus on drama. Um, and uh, Futurama Game of Thrones um, is a puzzle game set in the Futurama universe and it takes all the characters that you know and the visual style matches and it also has the same style of humor and comedy uh, going on. Um, but the thing is, it doesn't really stop with you researching um, what came before but you also have to set, your, set up your own rules that you then adhere to. Games are often developed over a long period of time, even mobile games nowadays, um, so that you either forget what you decided two years ago, or um, somebody else takes over and has no idea what you decided if you haven't documented it, and then things start to, um, in, start to uh, contradict each other and players are just gonna be like, wait, but I thought he was her father, now they're cousins? What happened? <laughs> um, but it's also not only about um, facts in the lore or the plot, uh, but also um, how you wanna convey the text, uh, at which point, um, how long is text, or um, do you use any text at all? Are there things like, um, mascots for different features, like this character only pops up when you can buy stuff in, in a shop because he's the shopkeeper or something. Um, uh, yeah, and you should also define how the player is, um, what kind of role the player is taking in this game. Are they role-playing another character? Are they playing um, a blank slate and can insert their own vision? Um, are they some sort of a like third person godlike, omniscient um, uh, character who influences what's happening. Um, you need to like write all of that down. Also, lexicons of the terms you've used so that you say the same things about the same things and don't call your hearts um, blood containers in another context, even though they're established as hearts. This includes localization too, by the way. Because sometimes it's like, oh yeah, and this is gon gonna be funny because this is uh, a pun with flowers and then the localization doesn't get the pun and there's no pun and it's a literal translation and it doesn't make sense anymore. So um, in case you ever need to worry about localization, putting little comments in there makes sense if you have something that might not translate that well literally. Uh, an example for conventions is uh, this thing from uh, Candy Crush Friends, um, which I did. Uh, basically, this is kind of like an achievement book where you can unlock uh, different badges for stuff you've done in the game. Um, how many cup like you crash um, 50 cupcakes and then you get the cupcake crusher achievement. Um, and you get rid of 50 licorice swirls and you're the swirl scientist. Um, and so on and so forth. So um, the rule here was basically use the correct names for these things. They're not often named in the game actually, they just exist, but they have a standardized name, which is sometimes not what your colleagues call them. So um, like for example, this puffler thing down there um, actually looks like these um, uh, twisty marshmallows, um, if you see the whole body with a little face. And I saw people call them marshmallows, butterflies, because they have wings, but they're actually called puffler. So using any other term would have been a bad idea. So sometimes you just have to play detective and find out what the right word actually is. Um, yeah, another um, thing that I decided here was that it's going to be playful, but kind of badass because you achieved something. Um, and also every term should ideally have an alliteration, so that it just rolls off the tongue easier. The next point is consistency. The sense that um, every narrative element tells the whole thing 
in the same situation and that things don't contradict each other. Um, this means that all narrative elements should be consistent inside the moment, inside the game, and inside the franchise. Um, so, for example, if a character is sad in a moment, then all elements should point to that. Uh, the character doesn't need to be sad for the whole game, unless that's their thing. Um, but uh, this, um, this is something that should be uh, ensured depending on how far the reach is intended to be. Um, you also need to make sure that voice and tone stay the same, and if they change, that they sh change at the same point in time. Because some games, for example, um, have a different way of addressing the player in different elements. Um, uh, for example, if you're playing an action adventure where you are actually the hero and characters talk to the hero and you are the hero, but then there's a tutorial pop-up and it addresses you as the player directly and suddenly it's not whimsical anymore uh, and not like in the game because the character doesn't know about the pop-up. So having the pop-up address the character should not happen. Like, um, in this case, there's two different ways um, of, uh, yeah, solving tone and addressing the player based on what the text is supposed to do. Um, yeah, already said, uh, consistent uh, naming and lexicon, and also is it consistent with real world and cultural expectations, and if not, is it sufficiently set up? If you don't do this, and um, this e example, this term refers to um, when gameplay and the story uh, contradict each other. For some reason, there's no term for everything else contradicting narratively, um, but theoretically, there can be a narrative dissonance between all elements in a game. But the ludo narrative dissonance, so the game story dissonance, um, is this phenomenon, which some of you might even know. Um, if your story is that you're a good-hearted policeman striving for peace in times of civil unrest, and the gameplay is you kill everyone in your way with a bunch of cool weapons, then uh, <laughs> there is some some friction between um, what the story is trying to tell you and what the gameplay is actually telling you. Because what you do is part of the story as much as what the game is telling you what the, um, what the story is. Um, so it's important to look into if we can align this and have the player do things that actually matches what the story tells you, what's happening. Um, this uh, problem of consistency on a moment-by-moment -moment basis is also, um, especially when it comes to games where you have choices and can influence the story, is um, when you give a new information, does the character that give, gives the information, does the character already know, or has it not happened yet? Like, you have to pay real attention to variables uh, in this case, um, because sometimes in games it happens that Characters either know something they shouldn't, or they know something um, ahead of time, or they are not aware of something that they should be aware of. Um, yeah, and this is also an uh, important part. Um, just as much as keeping the consistency with the emotional aspect of um, the, um, the character. Like, if you just insulted a character in an interactive dialogue very badly, and they're really, really pissed, and then you say something else, and it's always the same answer, and they suddenly sound normal. It's like, but it just insulted you. You were mad at me. Why are you suddenly okay? Um, yeah, uh, the more play uh, players can influence the story, the more complicated it gets. Um, yeah, basic tips are um, just look at all game elements as uh, narrative elements. Um, document your decisions. And um, even if they're not in the game yet, so not player facing, um, and refer the, to them a lot. Some games have huge story bibles and lore um, documents and character bios, and none of that is ever in the game. 
And that sounds like a waste, but it enables you to make better design decisions. Um, oh yeah, and if you have a, a plot-driven thing, track the narrative timeline somehow, like in a in a graph. Um, just don't rely on just words and programming, but um, use logic flows and uh, um, yeah, and other means to keep track. Yeah, even Candy Crush has a lore bible actually. Like even though there's barely any story in any of the games, there's like a rich world with a, a, a plot and so many different characters. Um, and this is intended to make design decisions uh, better and easier. So when game designers think of a new um, life up, a new temporary event, um, and they think of using um, this one character for it, that they can look into the bio and go like, okay, what would be a story or a theme that would make sense with this character? Who are they? Um, yeah, and um, all these tiny design decisions, when they're all coherent, it shows in the game even though, um, even when you're not telling a huge plot-driven story. The next point is clarity. It's actually pretty easy. Um, does the core message of whatever you're doing right now come across? Like, logically, emotionally, um, from a, a game mechanics point of view, um, regarding what the player is supposed to do, and feedback um, of what they've just been doing. Is the signposting correct, which is like gently guiding the player into the right direction of the solution by saying, oh yeah, that's right, and oh no, that's wrong. Um, are the short and long-term goals clear so that the player stays motivated to do something? And um, yeah, it's everything that they do, get a, an appropriate feedback. And um, in mobile games, do they understand this even when they skip texts and don't really pay attention? Um, yeah, tips for this is just to try handing out the right information at the right time, right before it's relevant. Um, don't over-explain, especially not with words, and use visuals um, and other stuff uh, instead. Look into established symbolism or genre conventions or archetypes to um, deliver information more easily. Uh, repeat information when needed, um, ideally when it's gameplay re relevant or when players take too long to find a solution. And um, when in doubt, it's more important to be clear than to be um, pretty, so to say. That um, sometimes the statement can get lost in funny phrasing or um, just too much of something. That when um, you write a really funny dialogue and the whole thing was actually just meant to be, oh, by the way, go into that cave and fetch me something. And you have like 20 minutes of dialogue. And somewhere in between they said that, and then at the end the player's like, wait. Even if it's a really nice dialogue, um, that <coughs> still doesn't um, add to uh, the experience of the game. Um, it's kind of similar in, in movie making, uh, unless you make like a for our movie, um, where scenes are meant to be as short as possible with as much content as possible. Uh, some example for themed signposting is um, this uh, St. Patrick's Day live event that was in uh, Candy Crush Friends in uh, April. Um, basically, in the beginning, you get a little cute instruction, like, oh, I'm on decoration duty for St. Patrick's Day. Let's fill some pots with gold stars. So gold stars are an established um, thing that you earn when you perform well in a level. Um, the gold ties into the leprechaun uh, theme. Um, yeah, and it's basically play level to earn gold stars, but it's like interwoven with a cute little story why you do it. Then when you go into your quest menu, um, while this event is going, you get this little reminder, collect all the stars to unlock Nutcracker's Leprechaun costume. And when you're done um, with the event, either because time ran out or you completed it, um, he gives you either uh, a fail or a win uh, response. That also serves as the um, resolution to his uh, task. 
the next point is um, context. Um, does your narrative design set up the context of the situation uh, sufficiently? Does the player understand enough, world, uh, enough of the game's world logic to navigate it uh, comfortably? And some games will want to keep some of that information um, undercover for some time, but they do, like for example, survival horror. Um, but this is for a dramatic purpose and not because it's accidental. And it's it usually uh, tied to a progression where things get clearer on the way. Um, does the player understand the emotional context? Like, what are my action? What do my actions mean? And how should I feel about it? And um, what do these actions mean to other characters in the game world? Um, it should also set up the current events, what's happening, and how is my action influencing this? Um, what are my motivations and what are my goals? Uh, my tips for this is uh, find elegant solutions. Just say a lot with as little words as possible and use visuals, um, systems, animations um, to, uh, yeah, to express this. And even, even the light atmosphere and the music can set the tone. Uh, use shorthand, so establish conventions and symbolism. Um, that can also be like... Um, movie, tropes, archetypes, something that players will instantly recognize. Um, and make sure um, to set up both the emotional and the logical meaning of the situation. And then after you've drafted um, a first version, test your assumptions. Because your experience might not be everybody's experience. And when you're like, oh yeah, um, witches or a positive image because they're they're strong independent women and they have knowledge in uh, herbal medicine so that's so cool um but then your i don't know target audience or the way um the character is designed um seems too villainous then you if if you want to have like a this this image of like the cool, powerful, knowledgeable woman, and the design um, seems evil. Then just redesign. Um, but yeah, uh, not everybody experiences things the same way. So you should test your assumptions with coworkers first, and ideally with um, uh, um, with um, yeah a test group. But not like every single thing, because that's just not feasible. Yeah, um, an example here uh, is, um, again, the achievement collection. Um, the context that is given here is like a little two-speech uh, bubble intro with Mr. Toffee, who's like, oh, as, my, um, as the mayor of Candytown, it's my duty to investigate that strange cloud kingdom that appeared above us. Um, so go on an expedition for me, and here's where I will collect your expedition badges for <coughs> achieving cool stuff. So basically, you're not like, oh, by the way, this is a game and these are your achievements. But it's um, more nestled inside the game world. Then the next aspect is character, or also personality, charm, lovability, connectability, emotional value. Um, uh, when you make narrative decisions, you should always ask yourself, does this only convey the minimal information in a very um, abstract, logical, clinical way? Or does this have personality? And with personality, I mean, um, does it give, um, give new insights into the character's personality that you're dealing with? Um, something about their current emotional state, about their background, about their quirks, about their relationships with other characters. Um, do you get to know them better just through this interaction? But also, does, it, um, does the decision reveal something about the game's identity and does it match this um, identity? Uh, is this funny enough for the game identity? Is this like the first reveal, oh, by the way, this isn't, isn't a serious shooter, it's a funny shooter. Um, does it also reveal the um, personality of the current mood? 
And also very important is, um, does it have the potential to intrigue um, the player so that they're curious about the current conflict's resolution? Do they care about um, what's going on based on the um, personality of the characters, the world, the experience? And um, tips for this is just like create and refer to your guidelines so you always know what you're doing. Um, Maybe do some practices um, by writing little dialogues of the characters that are not necessarily intended to get into the game. Um, get to know them. Um, write bi biographies even for NPCs. Um, but also don't sacrifice clarity for character. Um, as I said before, if you have something super amazing but then the player doesn't know what to do, that's not optimal. There are some cult classics that do this, and players are like, haha, so funny. Um, but like, this is supposed to set up um, best practices in, um, yeah, um, that should be guidelines, and not like, do this or your game sucks. Um, I would say, in general, the rule of thumb is when you um, make an unconventional narrative decision, do it with a purpose in mind and not just because. So if you like do sacrifice clarity for character, then do it with an intention in mind. And um, in general, I would suggest to simplify and not convolute stuff, even though it's, um, uh, it's easy to just continue on writing or throwing more cool visual stuff in there, but in the end it's just like fireworks and explosions, and you're like, wait, but what did my character do? And um, it's also better to repeat things a few times than to leave players confused. Um, also, other ways to convey your message without words, with visual, sound, animation, gameplay. Um, it's always better to use all aspects than just text. As an example for personality, um, uh, these are the bad guys from Candy Crush Jelly. Um, which is the candy game with the most dedicated bad guy team. Um, the Jelly Queen, Cupcake Call, and Licorice Larry. And um, what they do is that when you play boss modes in the game, um, you actually fight against them. So their roles as antagonists is literal. Um, there are some levels where you compete by um, spreading different color jelly, and when you spread more of your pink jelly, then you win. But they're not just uh, antagonists in title, they actually do antagonize you gameplay-wise. Cool, after this, um, just a few uh, short process tips in general. Um, uh, yeah, a, a few of those are repetitions, but um, just to summarize a few things. Um, that you should try to value um, elegance and clarity to say a lot with a short text and rather use um, other elements to tell a story as well and not only text, plot, dialogue. Um, you should know your genre and player habits. Um, you should always test your ideas with colleagues, playtests, um, or even data. Like, um, do some uh, scientific experiments. Some game companies do. Um, involve sensitivity readers. So, like, if it's probably a good idea for any game, but sensitivity reader um, would be somebody from a um, uh, from a minority or from another background than you in general. Um, that um, who goes through your stuff and then is like, oh, by the way, this part is kind of uncomfortable. Or like, oh, this part is actually kind of um, is kind of like stereotyping a nationality in a way, um, or something like, oh, could you um, could you uh, not use a, a mentally ill person in your horror game as the antagonist because that's kind of offensive now or something? Um, yeah, like uh, just to get like different perspectives from different places in the world.
and also in general just involve narrative designers in meetings early on or game writers or whatever you have um, or if if you don't have somebody dedicated to this that you just um, pay attention to it yourself because um, often this has been considered as the thing that you do in a short time frame and then the rest of the team just creates the game <laughs> and um, like for example, game writers like crank out a story in three months and then they leave. And that's usually a very bad idea um, because it's a very collaborative job where things influence each other and you should brainstorm stuff together so that the different elements of the game interlock more efficiently. Cool, and uh, that was it uh, for my uh, presentation part. And I'm now open for Q&A in English and German. Thank <laughs> you.